All right. So, these are some uh, questions which are very simple based on our previous lectures and I shall now keep raising these questions popping uh, them at uh, the end or beginning of uh, every lecture just to take a recap of the concepts that I have taught and um, uh, these are going to be simple short questions either conceptual or numerical. So, I would suggest that you take a pause and attempt these questions quickly. I would strongly suggest that you, you first solve it yourself and then go to the next slide to get the answers. So, um, for the single degree of freedom system in the undamped vibration case, um, we have seen that uh, the response is obtained uh, by an expression uh, which we uh, derived as x of t equal to capital X cos omega n t minus phi i. This uh, capital X we have seen that it is a function of the initial conditions that we impose. That is supposing that you have uh, a simple spring mass system uh, damping being ignored, we are having stiffness and mass as the two elements of the vibratory system. Now, in this case from its mean equilibrium position, if we disturb this with either uh, initial displacement x naught or initial velocity v naught that is the velocity given to the inertial mass uh, at t is equal to 0 that is how we define in initial displacement and initial velocity. Uh, and then after t uh, more than 0 that means, these conditions are imposed exactly at t is equal to 0 and after that there is no external stimulus to the system and the system is allowed to vibrate on its own once these initial disturbance is imposed. Now, as, as, we, as we see here that the amplitude of the response is given by an expression which is given here, um, it is a function of the initial conditions that is x naught and v naught and of course, omega n embodies the properties of the system k and m. Uh, what you notice here is, um, is the fact that the response uh, x as a function of time is a harmonic response. right? So, it, it has certain magnitude, uh, it has certain amplitude capital X and that uh, response varies harmonically given by this cosine term. Uh, the frequency with which uh, the oscillations happen is the natural frequency of the system omega n and there is um, some phase lag. Okay. So, this phase lag as I mentioned uh, we would call this as initial phase lag um, just to distinguish it from uh, another term phase which we shall see in case of the forced vibration. So, um, we call this as initial phase lag. Uh, now, uh, what I mentioned to you is that it depends either on x I mean the initial amplitude uh, x naught and v naught. So, suppose this capital X the amplitude with which it vibrates depends either on x naught or on v naught or both in fact. So, uh, it can be a function of both. Um, so, generally we uh, either have initial displacement or initial velo velocity. For example, as I mentioned if we have if we treat uh, a guitar string fixed at both ends as a vibratory system and if we plug this guitar string uh, at t is equal to 0 and then release it. So, this is the initial displacement that we impose and then when it is released from that initially displaced position it continues to vibrate. Um, as um, as the time goes by. Uh, whereas, uh, we may have uh, the same string like in Santur uh, musical instrument where uh, we, we strike it. So, uh, the fork or the tong basically uh, strikes the, the string uh, precisely that also happens in piano. Um, so, when you 
strike it with certain velocity that basically becomes the initial velocity condition. Um, in general we may say that it would also uh, I mean it, it you may have initial displacement and initial velocities as the two initial uh, conditions. And then the amplitude with which it will oscillate uh, depends upon both of these values uh, for a given uh, vibratory system. Now, it would be interesting to now see if we displace this vibratory system uh, from its mean equilibrium position um, with initial displacement let us say x naught. Okay. So, if I pull this mass um, and if x is treated positive downwards in this case. Um, so, let us say this is at time t is equal to 0 we have displaced it by x naught, but we simply release it from that displaced position. Uh, the spring is stretched up to this point and now when you release it, it will have um, uh, the response governed by this particular expression. What will be uh, capital X in this case because initial velocity is not imposed this term is 0 and obviously capital X will be uh, small x naught that is the initial displacement. And you can notice that if V naught is equal to 0 initial velocity being 0 this phi i um, stand inverse of 0. So, phi i uh, is going to be 0 which means that this expression will turn out to be x naught cos omega n t simply x of t is equal to um, x naught cos omega n t and which actually means that if I plot x positive downwards in this graph as well, uh, then this is the initial displacement that I will impose and then you will have a cosines curve being plotted here. Okay. So, the amplitude sorry the amplitude will be x naught and it executes uh, a cosine function um, which is expected because physically if you notice if you have stretched it to x naught and then released it the mass is going to move like this. The mass is going to move like this it is going to go on the other side of the mean equilibrium position and it will keep on oscillating that is how it happens when you have initial conditions as initial displacement. Suppose instead of initial displacement if I you know hit it with uh, an impulse which induces initial velocity v naught then and uh, this is applied at uh, time t is equal to 0 when there is no motion. Okay. So, the, the mass is stationary and x naught is measured from this mean equilibrium position and then what you will have is um, a condition where x naught uh, is 0. So, this is the condition where x naught is 0 and v at t is equal to 0 is some initial velocity with which I hit the mass or I induce initial velocity to the mass equal to v naught. Now, obviously, you may notice that x in this particular case uh, is going to be this x naught is going to be 0 whereas, uh, the second term stays and then capital X is going to be v naught by omega n. What would be phi i? It is going to be tan inverse of uh, v naught by x naught x naught is 0. So, tan inverse infinite infinity is going to give you the phase lag initial phase lag of 90 degrees. Now, if you substitute that in this e e expression, then your capital A sorry x of t is going to be v naught by omega n that is your capital X cos omega n t minus pi by 2 will turn to sin omega n t. Okay. So, that you can expect do not you I mean if we if we basically have um, an impulse given at the stationary position uh, at the at the initial position of uh, the mass the equilibrium position of the mass and if i hit it uh, i expect the response to be to be like this so that means the response is going to be sinusoidal 
okay i have not plotted the time properly but uh, you can imagine that this is the the harmonic time function in this case of initial velocity will follow the sin curve right so um, a harmonic function of uh, time uh, for a given uh, system having natural frequency omega n uh, whether it follows a cosine function or sine function depending upon the initial conditions what is uh, clear that the frequency with which it will oscillate about its mean equilibrium position is going to be the natural frequency of the system and that is undamped natural frequency of the system um, which is dependent on the stiffness and mass of the system. The amplitude of course, in this particular case is V naught by omega n as a general case the response amplitude capital X is going to be dependent on both X naught and V naught. So, you may have a situation when both of them are non-zero uh, that it might um, oscillate like this. Okay. So, it will start with some value which is going to be a function of both X naught and V naught. Okay. Amplitude of course, will be governed by that. The, the time period of oscillation uh, which is given by this distance between two consecutive peaks uh, because what we plot here is typically the time period period of oscillation and that period of oscillation all of us are aware is equal to 2 pi over omega n right. So, if omega n is your natural frequency of oscillation then the period of oscillation is going to be 2 pi over omega n and that is how um, the free vibration response uh, in the undamped case uh, would happen. And so, if you are interested in finding out the response at any instant of time for a system which is perturbed or disturbed from its uh, mean position, uh, this is the expression that you can use. Uh, it is completely defined when you have uh, a fully defined initial conditions like X naught and V naught. And so, if those two conditions are known and if you know your system, know your system in the sense you know your k, you know your ma, uh, m uh, mass of the system, then uh, you completely know the dynamic response uh, to initial disturbance. Now, it looks, um, uh, it, it looks um, the response uh, to be uh, how in, in practical situation, how would it happen that you have an initial condition uh, like uh, x naught and v naught, where will it come from? So, we might have couple of examples to, to discuss and therein you will uh, understand what this x naught and v naught would mean okay, uh, when you are in analyzing the vibratory systems response. Uh, obviously, most of our mechanical systems um, they have uh, all the time some kind of a forcing function. So, mostly the vibration response will be uh, forced vibration response, but uh, we would eventually use these expressions which we have derived in analyzing vibration response to some arbitrary excitations and therefore, these expressions which um, apparently looks relatively um, not so useful or um, uh, in the context of all mechanical system being subjected to harmonic or periodic forcing function. Uh, however, the, these expressions are very important um, in the larger context of vibration response. Okay, so, typically uh, when we first derive these governing equation of motion m x double dot plus k x equal to 0. Uh, you remember that uh, the system of course, was uh, a horizontal system like this and the mass is uh, oscillating in a frictionless surface and we, uh, we said that okay, x is measured uh, from an equilibrium position here and it simply oscillated around this mean equilibrium position. Um, Suppose, we have a system oriented like this and all the time we have been saying that this is the mean equilibrium position and uh, our x is measured uh, 
either vertically up or down positive uh, and it, it oscillates like this. Okay. So, when we uh, look at the free body diagram um, and uh, we consider this mass uh, isolated from surrounding, we say that okay, if uh, the mass uh, moves down, the restoring force because of the spring uh, will try will try to pull the mass up if it tries to go down and uh, the force is proportional to the, the displacement and that uh, in turn is the stretch in the spring. So, as the spring gets stretched more and more, so as x increases the restoring force k x obviously increases. Okay. And so, if we apply the Newton's law uh, m x double dot equal to uh, f which actually means um, if your x is going down uh, minus k x is the force and therefore, uh, the equation that we get is m x double dot plus k x equal to 0. Now, a typical um, question that is that is asked is where is uh, the gravity force gone. Okay. Uh, because of the gravity the force m g should act and we should consider m g into the forces uh, which are acting on the mass. The way we have considered the spring force why not also account for the gravity and that is the usual um, confusion or a problem which is faced. Um, so, the reason why we have not accounted for m g is, uh, is, is for this reason that supposing the spring is um, you know just hanging like this without the mass being attached and this is your position of the end of the spring and now if you attach this mass to the spring because of the weight of the mass the spring gets stretched and and now the new position of this mass is going to be here the moment the mass is attached this deflection all of us are aware is the static deflection or the deflection when the mass is not moving it is gently put uh, or gently connected to the end of the spring and the mass simply uh, you know pushes down and during that motion the gravity is acting on the spring and the spring gets stretched. So, the, the delta is the displacement or a stretch in the spring due to gravity loading. Right. So, if you uh, measure the displacements with this initial position of the spring just before the mass is attached to the spring, if this is considered as your x of t, then obviously, you will have to include the gravity as an additional force. Okay. But if we attach the mass and the, the, the mass slides to this position and uh, the gravity being a constant force it is going to settle down at a particular position uh, delta from this equilibrium uh, from this particular initial reference point then uh, the mass is going to be stationary at this point and afterwards when we apply these initial conditions uh, to the uh, mean equilibrium position of this mass then the mass is going to oscillate Okay. So, suppose we uh, describe this uh, you know motion uh, beyond or about this new equilibrium position of the spring mass system. This is the equilibrium position uh, just before the mass is attached to the end of the spring. So, now if we try to uh, write the governing equation of motion or generate the governing equation of motion. then Now, if we uh, try to uh, get the governing equation of motion uh, let us say about this point then you will have to consider the gravity. Okay. So, now how we how you do that is this mass would be moving with respect to this reference point and therefore, that motion is going to be delta plus y. Uh, 
So, that is basically is going to be your uh, motion with respect to this reference point and in that case then definitely uh, the gravity would act and will have to be accounted for. And the restoring force now in this case is going to be k into delta plus y and of course, y means y of t. So, now if you um, apply the Newton's uh, second law sorry this is going to be uh, mass times the acceleration which is going to be uh, uh, you know second derivative of this, this response term delta being constant is going to be m y double dot uh, will be equal to all the forces which are going to act on it. So, k into this is of course, negative because all the displacement velocities and accelerations are downward positive. So, k into delta plus y and minus uh, sorry plus m g because m g is acting in the direction where we have taken y and x all positive downwards. So, now if I uh, rearrange this m y double dot uh, plus k into y if I keep minus k into delta um, on the right hand side itself and then plus m g this is how I get it. Now, you may notice that k into delta in a static condition is uh, the restoring force which is proportional to uh, the stretch because of m g acting on it. right? So, uh, with that logic the gravity is going to be equal to k into delta because um, the stiffness uh, multiplied by the stretch initial stretch because of the presence of the gravity uh, loading is going to be um, generating the forces which are going to get balanced out. right? So, therefore, m g being equal to k into delta uh, the right hand side term uh, just turns out to be 0 and that is the reason why uh, if we are uh, considering the dynamic uh, response or motion with respect to the equilibrium position of the mass uh, and if this equilibrium position pertains to the static deflection then you do not have to account for the gravity, but if you measure it with respect to the initial reference point when the mass is attached to the spring then obviously, you will include the, uh, the gravity, but then you have to account for or you have to take the displacement with respect to this initial reference point. Incidentally now uh, since we have found that the natural frequency of oscillation for an undamped system is given by square root over um, square root of k over m you can get the alternate expression of k over m as uh, g over delta and therefore the expression for the natural frequency is also square root of g over delta okay so if you know um, a heavy machine if you mount um, on the isolators okay. and if you if you measure once this heavy machinery is uh, lowered on to these isolators and if you can measure the, the sag static deflection or a static sag of this whole machine on these isolators if you can measure that delta then you can find out the natural frequency of the system without knowing the mass uh, or the isolator stiffness okay that's um, that's the advantage of this expression so if you if you lower down a heavy machinery on the isolators and have uh, somehow managed to get uh, this delta measured then you can find out the natural frequency of the system okay <coughs> now So, we have discussed this part amplitude and frequency of vibration uh, amplitude is constant which is very important to note that when the system does not have damping uh, the system when it is perturbed with some initial displacement or initial conditions it continues to vibrate without uh, any change in its amplitude this amplitude remains the same 
uh, what it is at the at, at t is equal to 0. So, no, no dissipation in the system and therefore, the uh, energy at each cycle is same and therefore, the amplitude remains same throughout. Okay. Of course, is a hypothetical case because we know that even if there is no formal uh, damping mechanism like a dashpot in the system, there will always be some mechanisms or some system uh, some uh, means of uh, dissipation. Uh, the simplest is that unless you put the vibratory system in a vacuum, there will be aerodynamic damping. Okay. There will be friction in the uh, material of the spring or any structural member which is vibrating. So, uh, that would create uh, a reduction in the amplitude over time. So, as we progress uh, that is something which we will uh, discuss uh, shortly. Okay. And we what we saw is if this is the amplitude which is a function of these initial conditions, the frequency uh, which is inverse of this time. Uh, frequency in terms of cycles per second is 1 over t. Um, so, that is uh, in practice this is a common uh, unit of uh, frequency of vibration uh, cycles per second or hertz that is 1 over the time period of oscillation. Now, before we um, you know look into the uh, damped vibration case, uh, let us take an example here. Uh, of a simple vibratory system. Uh, the job is to find out the natural frequency of the system and um, so, this is a, a rectangular beam uh, which is fixed in the wall and at the end of this um, beam you have a, a hoisting drum as you can notice in the side view. Uh, that drum is lowering uh, a mass or it may be lifting uh, a load uh, from the ground um, and we are supposed to explore this um, system for its uh, natural period of vibration. Okay. Um, how would you model this? Now, we if you recollect our entire vibration analysis process um, starts first step is to convert this physical system which is being represented here into a corresponding vibratory system. So, a simplified model has to be built before we analyze the system. Now, uh, it looks apparently little complicated to, um, to figure out how do I convert this into a vibratory model and uh, as I have been saying all the time that uh, that first step is really uh, the most critical and challenging step. But, uh, that step will become easier uh, as we go along and as you solve many problems. Um, what we need to uh, now make few assumptions here, first is this beam is small enough in terms of its cross section. So, this is the rectangular beam that I am talking about um, and if you, you have a heavy uh, mass which is uh, being lowered from here. So, obviously, um, the the, the flexible element in this entire vibratory system or entire system, um, we may assume that the beam is the stiffness or beam is the, the compliant member in the whole setup. Okay. So, you all know a cantilever um, you know with, with an end uh, mass or a force which is acting here. How do I get the flexibility or the uh, stiffness of the of, of a cantilever. Okay. So, I will have to model now this uh, this beam um, as a stiffness element. So, my first um, uh, simplified model is going to is going to represent this beam as a spring element and you all know uh, go back to your solid mechanics strength of material books you can find out the relationship uh, of delta the deflection at the tip where the force is being applied as uh, if, if this force is f let us say right. So, which gives me uh, force over delta which is k the stiffness as 3 e i over L cube. 
right. So, based on the flexural rigidity of the system E is the Young's modulus, I is the area moment of inertia and obviously, because the, the, the cantilever is, is bending about this axis, we will have to take area moment of inertia of that rectangle 1 over 12 uh, B d cube, where B is the width of this um, cross section um, and, and, and D is the thickness here. Okay. So, it is all straightforward to find uh, the stiffness of this particular structural member, okay. L is the length of this cantilever. So, once it is done, we basically get the numeric value of the parameter of the vibratory system, the k, the stiffness. But that is not the only system here, you have a winch uh, sort of a pulley, uh, which is lowering the mass. The mass itself is quite substantial in the sense that we may have to again make assumptions. It is all about making assumptions and getting on um, uh, by, by, by capturing the system in its simplified vibratory form. So, another ex, uh, assumption that I make here is that I will treat this pulley to be massless. Okay. We shall look at what happens if this uh, pulley is not considered massless and it is actually not massless as such, but compared to the mass which is being lowered from here, if this mass of the pulley is let us say uh, 100 kgs uh, and the mass being lowered is let us say 1000 kgs, then we may as a first approximation. Uh, consider this to be massless. So, that means, the mass of the pulley is uh, relatively uh, you know small as compared to the mass being lowered. It is also important uh, that the first assumption was that the cantilever is contributing to the stiffness property, but not to the mass property. That means, I am also assuming that this particular member is massless or having mass which is substantially smaller than the mass which is being lowered here. Of course, these are all assumptions and they do have influence on um, the output that you get, but uh, these are all engineering assumptions. Um, you have to make assumptions to arrive at solutions, right. So, uh, it will uh, influence the results, but um, if we know what we are doing, uh, we can refine our solution process, we can refine our model to come up, uh, come at uh, a more accurate solution. Each uh, step towards more accurate solution involves making a model more complex, uh, more involved and uh, lengthier. So, it is all with certain assumptions we will get the natural frequency of the system. So, presuming that the mass of this cantilever and the mass of this uh, pulley and the entire winch system there is comparatively smaller as compared to the mass being lowered, then we can um, complete the modeling of the remaining part. What is the remaining part? This beam was considered to be a spring and assuming that this is massless, can we attach this mass at this end to complete the model? Um, it all depends again. So, this rope is a, a small diameter wire rope and it is being um, it is being used to suspend the mass at the end of it that is this mass and no matter what even if this is a steel rope it will stretch okay it has its own flexibility so it is prudent to consider the rope itself as a spring so you all know that a thin cylindrical piece itself has its own stiffness so if it is subjected to uh, tensile loading uh, delta is P L by A E, where A is the cross sectional uh, area of the rope or of this particular member. If it is circular, that area is going to be pi, uh, pi by 4 into diameter square. And so, this cross sectional area is of the wire or any cylindrical specimen. If it is square, you will have accordingly area being replaced. E is the Young's modulus of the material uh, the wire is made up of. So, if uh, E I mean if, if, if the rope here is made of steel, uh, 
you will have appropriate value uh, to be used for this E. L is the length. So, if I re, uh, you know denote this as capital L, then I can use this capital L of the wire as uh, the parameter here and F um, or P in this case is the load being applied here. Okay. Now, uh, of course, the load being applied is going to be uh, the load uh, which is suspended from this wire. So, once you know this I can find out k which is nothing but p over delta as we have found in the previous case is a e over l. So, for a, a, for a uniaxial member like this um, a cylindrical wire rope um, a e over l is the stiffness of this wire rope. So, instead of using this mass or using or attaching this mass at the end of this cantilever what I would uh, now do is I will use the spring representing the rope. So, I will call this as k r and this as k b and this k b in my case is going to be uh, 3 e i by l cube the, uh, the, the stiffness of the beam and k r is the uh, stiffness of the wire rope and now at the end because these two springs are in series because you can see that um, uh, this is this this end of the beam is essentially connected to the wire rope. Okay. So, these two springs k b and k r will be in series um, because the extension of this mass because of the flexibility in the wire rope happens um, independent of the deflection in the beam. Even if you make this infinitely rigid the deflection in the rope will happen um, because of its own flexibility. Uh, now, you all know how the springs in series are are accounted for. So, if I if I have this spring uh, st having stiffness k 1 and the other one with k 2 if they are connected in series we know that the equivalence stiffness is going to be k 1 k 2 over k 1 plus k 2 you can uh, you must have studied this earlier right. If these two springs are in parallel they simply get added. Okay. So, if the springs are in uh, are in parallel then this is for the series case and if they are in parallel then they will be simply k 1 plus k 2. Okay. So, in this particular case um, a simplified vibratory model will now be um, an equivalent stiffness which includes the stiffness of the rope as well as the stiffness of the beam and the mass uh, being load um, that basically becomes the, um, the, the final uh, simplified model. Okay. Here because we do not know how to take care of multiple masses um, we have restricted ourselves to a single mass system. Uh, assuming this uh, winch mass to be negligible compared to the mass m and of course, this beams mass is also neglected. So, finally, one can find out um, a simplified vibratory model from this and because we have seen how for such a simple single degree of freedom system the natural frequency is given by square root k over m and in this case it is k is going to be k e and that k e is going to be given by this expression where k 1 is the k of beam um, and k, r, k 2 is uh, the stiffness of the rope. So, k b k r over k b plus k r is the equivalent stiffness and with that you can find out the natural frequency of this entire system. Is that clear? Now, the question is how does it matter now? I mean from the design perspective whatever is the numeric value of the natural frequency let us say it turns out to be 13.7 okay, radians per second or maybe yeah. So, let us say instead of radian uh, all right. So, we can have it radians per second only. Um, 
how does it matter having some numeric value calculated how does it matter what what will it how will it help you in this whole design process okay so when we are uh, learning vibration as a, as a fundamental theory we should always uh, ensure that we learn to relate what we get through this analysis uh, to the design process okay so Piyush, how will you use this information? How do I, how do I make use of the information that I get? Maybe as I said, 13.7 radians per second by substituting all these values, I have got this value of omega n. How do I use this information in ensuring that my design in terms of all these cross sectional dimensions, the length I have chosen, the mass of this winch, maybe I may not be able to change it even if I am required to, but there will be certain situations or certain parameters which I may be able to modify. How do I use this information? So, please make a note that this, this drum may be rotating however slow it is okay. and that rotation is going to create excitation to this system. This entire system is vibrating. Okay. So, if, if this motion and the associated fluctuating force because of unbalance or whatever other uh, excitation function that it generates will create excitation to this entire system. Okay. So, you have to always look into the operation of the system and whether excitation frequency omega is anyway related or close to this natural frequency which I am calculating. It may turn out that it may not be um, exactly matching, but if, if, even if it is close enough, it would create lot of problems uh, in terms of larger deflections rather than um, you know simple lowering operation that you, you find here. Okay. So, um, if, if this winch is operating or the motor is operating, if this winch is connected with a gearbox, if the gearbox is operating at a higher speed and if that speed matches with the natural frequency of this entire system, you should make sure that you adjust the parameters of this vibratory system, maybe make this thicker, you know reduce the length if possible. Okay. And uh, so, making changes to the cross section of this beam is going to be much easier, sometimes the mass may not be uh, easy to change and so on. Right. So, all the time when you when you get this response or um, the vibration features or vibration characteristic in terms either of uh, its response or natural frequencies, this is something which we should immediately uh, start looking at how do I make use of this output in terms of better uh, design of the system. Now, the next question that I have asked here is that is there a possibility that this system is a nonlinear system. Okay. Is this system a linear or nonlinear? Assuming that the amplitudes are well within limits, that means we are not saying that the amplitudes are large enough so that it becomes uh, a nonlinear system, because we discussed this that if the relationship between the force and displacement, if that is not uh, linearly related, then the system is not linear. So, k the stiffness if it is not a constant value then the system is nonlinear. So, assuming that still at whatever vibration amplitude it vibrates with amplitudes are reasonably small even with that whether the system will be is it possible to have it uh, have this system to be nonlinear. Okay. Now, out of uh, the, the assumptions that we made is that this is the stiffness of the beam, mass of the pulley or a winch is neglected and then you have this mass uh, sorry the stiffness of the rope and the mass. Okay. What is the expression that we use for the stiffness of the rope, where this L is this length. Now, when the mass is lowered or is being lifted up, 
this length is changing. So, your stiffness itself is changing. Okay. The only question is when your oscillations are happening, if this length is changing fast enough compared to the time of oscillation, okay, then only the system parameter is can be considered to be changing continuously. Okay. But supposing that uh, you know this is moving way too slow which typically is the case you know it moves very slowly. So, if it is moving very slowly and your oscillations are maybe 10 or 20 oscillations already in that period you know of moving up. So, the if that movement is slow enough then you can treat the system to have constant parameters like k and m right mass of course, is is constant, but supposing that this mass you know is uh, you, you, you keep adding the mass to this mass being lowered or, or raised that the mass of course, is constant most of the times right. Uh, but if, if the, the mass being uh, lifted up or lowered, uh, if that movement is fast, uh, then you may have to think whether the system has a constant k r assumption valid or um, typically I expect that the movement of this mass during the lowering and lifting up is reasonably it is moving reasonably slow. So, that um, the k r can be presumed constant, but do make a note that uh, the, the natural frequency that you obtain when the mass is uh, completely at the top or when the mass is completely close to the ground those two natural frequencies can be different because the lengths of the rope will be different. Okay. Let us say let us take this another example here and um, it is it's, it's solar panels of a spacecraft. So, these solar panels are um, can be seen on uh, the circumference and four of them um, situated at e equal angle as you see here. The panels uh, dimensions are all given here their density is known. So, basically you can you can use this as uh, as a mass element right and they are attached at the end of this cylindrical uh, rod aluminum rod. Uh, in actual case of course, you will not have them as, as rods, but uh, they may be uh, this kind of um, shape you can you can have a look at some of these uh, solar panels which are used. But I mean for for the sake of an example uh, we we assume that it is a simple aluminum rod if if that shape is different you can as well find out um, from your solid models what is the uh, for what is the stiffness of such uh, structure. But assuming um, that there is uh, uh, an aluminum rod here uh, at the end of which this panel are, are mounted and these rods are. Um, are connected to this body of the of the spacecraft. Um, so, using this dimensions and the weight density you can you can find out the, the mass property um, of the panel and what is given here that if the spacecraft main body if it is assumed rigid we are supposed to analyze this solar panel for its vibration characteristic essentially to find the natural frequency of vibration. Okay. Now, how do you convert this physical system into a simplified vibratory model? Now, make a note that they, they are completely independent of each other all these solar panels are all independent right. So, we can treat uh, one solar panel assembly as one vibratory system and they are all identical vibratory systems in fact. So, how do I model now uh, what you, you would agree that if the solar uh, I mean the satellite uh, outer body if this is uh, assumed rigid then I can uh, I can use this aluminum uh, bar to represent them uh, represent as, as a spring. Um, again assuming that the mass of that bar is negligible compared to the mass of the solar panel and the mass of the solar panel is something which is uh, at the end okay. and you can find out the, the parameters of this vibratory system k and m uh, from the 
data given right. So, this is again the simplest of the models uh, that you can uh, uh, you can represent this solar panels and uh, find out the natural frequency ok. Now, how do you find k? m of course, is very simple you have dimensions given volume multiplied by the density will give you the mass. What about k? How do I find k? Now, again just like in the previous example this can be treated like a cantilever. It is a circular mem uh, member and I can find out uh, using this expression again you you can refer to strength of material uh, for the expression which is known ok 3 e i by l cube e i is again the flexural rigidity of um, the circular shaped cantilever l is the length ok. So, again there are some issues here that what l shall I consider shall I consider only up to this point or shall I take it from the center and so on right, but I can uh, there will be assumptions in involved in this case as well. I mean, uh, because the deflection beyond this point is not going to be uh, strictly uh, the deflection of a cylindrical piece. Um, so, it, it uh, this L will be uh, only up to this point and then I can assume that this mass is completely at, at this location. Again, this is going to generate uh, you know values which are going to be slightly off from the actual value, but this is the first cut natural frequency value that we can get. We can make it more complex, more involved um, and, and take care of that, but a, as a simple vibratory system um, I can take this L to be the length of the cylindrical part, but <coughs> the mass of course, you can find uh, from the dimensions and I can use that mass to find out the natural frequency. But what stops this solar panel from vibrating in a torsional sense? Why are we only restricted to the bending vibration of this system right? Because uh, you may know that the, the satellite is positioned by you know by some internal mechanisms like right? reaction wheel assemblies operate and then they, uh, they generate some kind of a movement which can excite the torsional mode of vibration. So, it is not only that this panel is going to vibrate in the lateral vibration or bending vibration, but it can also generate torsional vibration particularly look at the size of this panel. The panel size is going to have a reasonable polar area moment of inertia a polar mass moment of inertia ok. So, uh, this panel can uh, can generate significant twisting inertia or torsional inertia at the end of this uh, cylindrical piece. So, there would be a polar uh, mass moment of inertia uh, I can represent and then I can also get the torsional stiffness of the cylindrical uh, part and then I can the way I can get the bending natural frequency I can also get the torsional natural frequency of this system where uh, this is going to take the form like this. So, Whereas, this k t is the torsional stiffness and last time we discussed how to find the torsional stiffness of, of any member ok. So, for a cylindrical member you can use the expression as uh, t over i p is equal to g theta by l with which is in, in you know involving the shear modulus of the material ok. So, and then you, you have T over theta as the torsional stiffness k t and that is going to be right. G here is the shear modulus, modulus of rigidity. So, all these uh, you know material properties and geometric properties once they are known it is all straightforward to find out the natural frequency, but now you understand now this physical system you have to see and think about it as to how do I model this as a vibratory system. And as we you know discussed in some of the initial lectures that a single mass and a single spring does not mean only one natural frequency ok. 
that mass and that spring together in what mode of vibration it, it is uh, oscillating that will decide uh, that the system uh, you know this mass may have all the 6 degrees of freedom. It may have this motion, this motion and the rotational motion and therefore, you may have multiple natural frequencies and for each of these modes you have to figure out and extract an appropriate stiffness term, appropriate mass term to generate the natural frequency. So, in this case um, at the moment most likely natural frequencies to get excited are the bending ones and the torsional ones. Okay. Again how can this information be useful to the designer? It can, it can. So, it depends upon how, how the uh, structure is. Suppose, the structure is not symmetric, they will couple. Just like in the, in the blades which are there in, in, in the steam turbines, the blades are helicoidal that means, they are curved. So, you will less likely to get a pure bending, the bending will be always coupled with torsion. Okay. But let us not complicate the things at the moment, but yes, uh, the bending vibration can get coupled to torsional vibration, then you will have a coupled bending torsional natural frequency. Okay. So, how, how, how would this information be useful to the designer? You know, so, that if there are equipments which are housed inside this satellite, which are operating at certain frequencies, they should not be run close to these natural frequencies. Otherwise, you will have amplification of this, um, you know, their vibration response. And as you know that uh, apart from the material damping, there will be no other damping in space, right. Okay. So, this is how once you uh, analyze uh, a given physical system for its simplified vibratory system. Uh, of course, we have not derived in each of these cases the governing equation of motion. Why? Because we are uh, once we uh, you know model this as a simple vibratory system, single degree of freedom system. Since we have already derived the governing equation of motion and we know that the natural frequency is given by square root of k over m, we are straight away using it. But as a general case, you will have to then um, get the free body diagram and then generate the governing equation of motion and from that you have to get the expressions for the natural frequency, which is something which we will do later on when we migrate to a multi, many degrees of freedom system. Is that clear? I hope this is, this is fine. So, this is another example that I have uh, taken for finding out basic uh, natural frequency expression. Um, the next example which actually now focus on the response to initial disturbance. We, we have not seen or taken an example where the system is disturbed at t is equal to 0. Okay. So, of course, the example given uh, uh, you know you take your time to read through it. Essentially, it says that you have a, a, a overhead traveling crane which you see on, on many of the factories workshops. You will have uh, an overhead crane which is um, supported at both ends. These are um, you know uh, these are the walls on both sides and um, in the workshop if you want to lift certain things from the from the floor, um, the overhead traveling crane will do the in, do that job for you. Um, this horizontal frame uh, is assumed to be rigid enough and then there are um, uh, motorized system here which will uh, again use the same kind of winch which we have seen in the previous cases and we we don't care now at the moment how it uh, how this load gets lifted up and down okay what is important is this entire system physical system how do i convert this into a simplified vibratory model now assuming that this mass is uh, located centrally to this platform and um, I can then treat this entire system as a rigid body and treat it like a mass okay. and the suspensions on either side of this traveling crane um, is treated like a spring. Okay. So, there are suspensions here which will have their own suspension stiffness k. So, if both of them are k, 
this equivalent spring is going to have a stiffness of 2 k because both of them are in parallel. Okay. So, okay. so, what we are doing is we are we are converting this physical system of overhead, uh, overhead crane as a mass and that mass is sitting over a spring. This spring has twice the stiffness of individual suspension springs here and these wheels are rolling over rails which you can see here. These rails are on the um, on the platform here, I, I, I mean uh, these are all at the these these will be laid on uh, a foundation okay now the example that is involved is a section of the rail 6 meter long of the crane travel is improperly laid as a result of which this section okay is 5 millimeter below the rest of the crane travel that means this crane is traveling like this and suddenly a 6 meter long rail is improperly laid and therefore, it gets shifted down by a, a small step of 0 0.05 meters or 5 millimeters. Sorry. Okay. If the train is, uh, if the crane is uh, traveling at a uniform speed of 3 meter per second, so here the, the motion of this uh, crane is 3 meter per second. Determine the response of the crane during the period of travel when it goes on to this particular uh, part of the uh, rail, right. So, up to this point the crane is travelling without any vibration. So, it is uh, steadily moving with a constant speed and then suddenly this will drop to a lower height because the rail is dipped because of the problems at the foundation and we are supposed to find out the response uh, during its travel in this particular section of the rail. Okay. Now, there are few uh, assumptions involved of course, the first is the damping is neglected and therefore, we can see that it is a simple spring mass system no damper there and we assume that this is the important assumption that when the crane shifts from this particular uh, uh, rail to this particular rail that the, the wheel suddenly uh, goes down. Okay. That means, the crane falls on the depressed rail section as a sudden step displacement that is important. So, the, the, the wheel does not uh, simply bounce by certain distance like this. Okay. It is simply from this point to this point the, uh, the, the movement of the wheel happens all of a sudden okay. that is the assumption involved. Okay. So, let us let us look at this example um, that the initial mean position of the, the crane is this and as it travels and uh, encounters this sudden uh, jump, the wheel immediately takes this position, but the mass will continue to travel along this line, is not it? It cannot just simply follow the wheel, wheel is simply uh, just touching the bottom part of this rail. Now, you all agree that this 6 meter long uh, travel of the crane, what will be the mean position of this? Will the mean position be here? No? So, the mean position is going to be somewhere here slightly lower. That mean lower mean position has to be same as the dip in the in the rail right. So, that dip in the rail is let us say 5 millimeter. Okay. So, the new mean position is going to be 5 millimeter below the original mean position of the travelling crane. Now, what we have to do is to start looking at the response vibratory response assuming that the position at this point is going to be at t is equal to 0. Okay. 
and from this point onwards how will the crane oscillate and what will be the amplitude of oscillation of that crane. What will be the expression of that response? We all know that the response to initial disturbance is x cos omega n t minus phi i where capital X is equal to square root of x naught square plus v naught by omega n square that these expressions we have already derived. And of course, phi i is equal to tan inverse of v naught upon omega n x naught. Now, when you start the motion at t is equal to 0, when it, it, it suddenly dips and suddenly goes over this depressed rail section, what are these initial conditions? I am going to uh, assume the response about the new mean equilibrium position as let us say x of t and x is taken as positive upwards let us say. Okay. What will be sorry, what will be x naught and what will be v naught? Please make a note that the train the crane is traveling steadily with some speed and it does not have any vibratory displacement or a vibratory motion. Okay. So, will there be v naught? Please make a note x naught and v naught are transverse to its you know um, linear motion right. So, it is moving ahead at certain velocity uh, at certain speed and x is measured transverse x is measured vertically up and down whether there will be any initial velocity to the mass of the crane. So, this is of course, equal to 0 because there is no transverse uh, displacement or velocity. Now, the whether there is any transverse x naught yes because uh, instantaneously at t is equal to 0 the wheel touches the lower uh, depressed section of the rail, but the mass stays here because of its inertia and therefore, uh, you may treat x naught to be equal to plus 5 millimeters. Okay. So, the mass stays there the spring pushes the wheel down and now, you have a mass slightly at an elevated position at t is equal to 0 and that because x is treated positive upwards your x naught or x at t is equal to 0 becomes plus 5 millimeters. Okay. And obviously, if v naught is 0 how much will be phi i right. So, then x of t is going to be capital X. Now, capital X for V naught equal to 0 becomes X naught which is 0 I mean which is 5 millimeter. So, if we express all the responses in millimeter then this is going to be 5. So, capital X equal to X naught equal to 5 millimeters. So, it becomes 5 cos omega n into T. Now, what is omega n? square root of k over m and that you can find out from the data given in the example. Okay. Um, so, this response is with which the crane is going to um, move the moment it encounters that uh, depressed uh, rail section. Okay. So, obviously, 5 cos omega n t please make a note that it is a cosine term. So, it is um, this is the usual position. So, from here, so it is going to be um, the cosine function is going to be looking like that. So, it will start with at t is equal to 0, it will start with 5 millimeter amplitude and then subsequent oscillations will happen at its mean equilibrium position. Okay. And the frequency of these oscillations is going to be omega n which you can find from the stiffness and mass properties of the crane. Okay. Suppose as an extension to this problem 
suppose the next rail section after 6 meter of travel is back to its original level and I am interested now to find out what is the response in this section, what would I do? So, I will redefine, I will redefine my time here, okay. T will be 0 in this rail section, but now the initial conditions will change. Okay. So, x naught will it be minus 5, because when, when it comes on to this rail section, the new level is going to be the original level of this screen, okay, if at all it comes to the original level. So, which means that if the crane is without any vibrations and moving like this, okay, then the, there will be a step change of 5 millimeter, but that 5 millimeter will be a compressed spring. right? So, it is going to be minus 5 millimeter as an initial x naught and how much will be v naught? will it be 0? Will it be 0? Of course, we have defined already there that there is no damping. So, it is a undamped case. Okay. So, what we will have to do is at this instant of time, we will have to first find out what are the vibration because of these initial conditions. So, I will uh, find out x dot t as minus 5 omega n sin omega n t that is the derivative I get there to get a expression for the uh, velocity. And for the new initial conditions, for the new initial condition, new in the sense when I am interested in exploring what is the vibration in this zone, I will have to take x at t is equal to 0 that is my x naught for from these two expressions. So, now this is going to be uh, sorry for the new initial conditions, I, I will make use of these expressions for t is equal to uh, how much time would it take for me to travel from here to here? Okay, that I will get from from my speed. Uh, so if if it is moving at three meter per second, okay. So obviously, um, for a six meter long rail, time for me to get to the end of this section is going to be uh, six by three. That is two seconds. So, I will get this at 2 seconds, x at t is equal to 2 seconds. So, I will make use of 5 cos omega and whatever natural frequency that I have multiplied by 2. That will give me the amplitude at, at t is equal to 0, because of the vibrations during the travel on this particular rail. So, that x naught will be my vibrations at this particular instant of time and I may not have any new v naught, but I will have the v because of the earlier vibrations. So, v naught for me is going to be x dot at t is equal to 2, which will mean minus 5 into omega n sin omega n into 2 that is basically uh, v naught. So, to, to start with this x naught, actually this x naught is not going to be minus 5, that x naught now is going to be minus 5 plus this value. And v naught, there is no new initial uh, velocity encountered here. So, I can use the previous sections uh, velocity at t is equal to 2. So, that is sin uh, 
omega n into 2. So, these are going to be the new initial conditions for my travel of the crane in, in the third section of the rail that is this section. Is that clear now? So, this is how you can find out the response of the crane during its travel uh, both during this period as well as during this period. So, vibrations will be different in the two sections. In the first case we just took x naught as minus 5 uh, for this particular case because it was assumed that the crane is not vibrating before it reaches to that step section and therefore, um, in that case we used x naught equal to 5 as initial condition, uh, but for this particular travel or this particular section we have to take the vibrations uh, at the end of this rail section uh, to be considered or updated for the new initial condition starting from here for this section of the travel ok. That is how we do it. Okay, here is the summary of uh, our lecture number 4. What we discussed is the undamped free vibration response to initial disturbance like. Right? So, the initial disturbance that we are talking about is uh, the initial uh, displacement or initial velocity that is imparted to the simple single degree of freedom system at t is equal to 0 and on uh, I mean on subjected to those initial conditions what is the ensuing vibration response is what we discussed. We took some practical examples based on these concepts and uh, I hope this uh, particular part is clear to you. Now, based on this these are the recall questions that you should attempt uh, very simple and straightforward as such um, and then uh, you can review the answers that you got uh, by looking at the answers given in the next slide.